So I want to welcome you all to our entomology update today. We are pleased to have with us uh, Dr. Justin Talley, who is the extension entomologist from Oklahoma State. Um, he received his PhD here in, in Kansas, and so he's happy to continue working with us in our absence of anyone with his specific expertise. And so we've asked him today to share with us uh, some updated information about fly control. I would remind you that we recorded another webinar with him a couple of years ago that's on your agent resources page that would uh, expand on some of the things he'll just hit and review today. So remember that as another option. So with that, uh, Justin, I'm going to mute my microphone and turn this over to you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, like Sandy said, I'm a former Kansas State graduate. Uh, I still bleed purple as much as I can, but I have to wear orange as much as I can as well. So um, today I'm going to be talking to you about some fly control options. Most of this talk is going to be focused on cow-calf operators. Um, but really, I, if you have questions over any kind of operation, um, I'll, I can address those. At the end of this slideshow, I have some slides on equine. Um, really, there's some specific uh, pests that are associated with equine and how we control them is a little bit differently than from a cow-calf operation. As, you, as I go through these, uh, please ask questions. I'm going to try to keep up with the chat questions, but if you see me looking away, it's because my chat screen is off onto the other screen. It's not onto the screen in front of me. So just to get started, uh, I want to really uh, iterate that uh, when you talk about fly control, you've really got some things to consider. For those of you who saw the previous um, webinar, uh, you're going to see uh, some repetition, but uh, today's talk, I'm going to really focus on some new things that are coming out, especially the vet gun, and I've, I've got one slide to, to really talk about injectable products and how efficacious they are on external parasites as well. The main thing we want to consider is the economic threshold. So an economic threshold is uh, can vary between uh, animal systems, but in cow-calf systems, we really don't have these really well defined. And the only tests that they're really defined in are the horn flies. And so the horn flies are the small body flies that get on their back usually starting around June for your area and going all the way through the end of September, just depending on what the weather conditions are doing. But I, I will always tell you, animal husbandry can come into these economic thresholds. One specifically is if you've got animals in good body condition score, they can handle more parasites. Uh, their immunity uh, can handle those parasites. So instead of just putting a ton of insecticides on them or being concerned about uh, high fly loads, if they're in good body condition score, they can handle those. And, I, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about those. The other thing is pesticide resistance. We're seeing this uh, uh, occurring very rampant, especially in horn flies. Um, there's a lot of products out there, and they tend to be the same thing. And what I mean by that is they kill the insect in exactly the same way. And so you have product A and product B, and they may have a different... Uh, uh, trade name, but uh, essentially they kill that insect in the same way. So we're, we'll, we'll kind of address some of this on the pesticide resistance, um, uh, and that's related to pest, pest biology. And the pest biology is really related to the reproductive potential of that pest. So if you want to compare just within two fly species, so we have a lot of horse flies and deer flies in, in Oklahoma, especially around this part of Oklahoma. And in Kansas, you would have these more on the, probably the eastern half of the state, but you, it can be an occasional problem. Tabanids or horse flies generally only go through one generation per summer. Horn flies will go through nearly 30 different generations. So if you're selecting for resistance, it can develop very rapidly in a horn fly population. And then, like I said, pesticide resistance and the knowledge of the pesticide classes uh, that's really uh, related to looking at a product and identifying what pesticide class it, it, it belongs to, whether it's an organophosphate or pyrethroid. Really, those are the two 
only two uh, for cow-calf operators. And then you have your avermectins or avamectin type products, which we kind of group into a larger category called macrocyclic lactones. And uh, of course, they use those for internal parasites as well. And when I uh, address uh, any kind of operation, and really what I want to advocate to you guys, when you go out there and talk to your producers, is remember their goals. It's not to eliminate every fly or every parasite that's on that animal, but really essentially to raise pounds. And in today's dollars, those pounds uh, mean more than anything. Uh, so for every dollar you put into that animal, you could essentially get almost $40 back in the returns. Um, we we all always see that on the internal parasite control. So your your deworming program, we see that in, in horn flies and other body fly species, we see this as well. And just to kind of give you uh, an understanding of the cost involved in this, this is just the U.S. cattle industry alone on an annual loss basis that accounts for loss of production as well as the cost to control these different types of pests. And you see horn flies and stable flies and horse flies are the top three external parasites. Um, you know, and, and, and this can vary in regional, but horn flies are always going to be a problem, especially in pasture beef animals. The way I like to put it, if you look at uh, my dad and I trying to work cattle, it, these things can sneak up on you. And essentially you have that third calf that you have this guy that knows a ton about the cattle industry like my dad does. But every third one, he's letting out, and I'm having to catch it and put it back in. And what I, I really want to advocate is that these, these losses can really sneak up on you. And um, so a producer may be going along and having no fly problems at all, and then it's just an explosion of flies. And, well, he's really already behind the ball because he's, uh, he's going to spend, have to spend twice as much just to get that horn fly population down and then try to uh, – prevent the pest population from becoming an outbreak again. If you were to look at these, uh, face flies are, are a problem in, in Kansas and in certain parts of Oklahoma, but I would say more so of a problem for you guys in Kansas, because this is what we call a cooler season fly. They overwinter as adults, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So if you were to look at that list, I'd still have horn flies and probably stable flies, but I'd probably replace uh, face flies for horse flies for you guys uh, because you, you have them for longer periods of time. You have higher populations than we do here in Oklahoma, and it's just something that you, your, your calipers are going to have to deal with on a regular basis. So as, as we go through this, uh, please, if you ask, uh, ha have a question on a slide, please use the chat box, and I'll try to address it then while it's kind of fresh, fresh on everyone's mind. But um, here in Oklahoma, we've had a major issue with feed guide. And, and the main, what we call the main vector of that, the main pest that carries that, that bacteria, that Morexelia uh, bovis bacteria, are face flies. And of course, there's other things that can carry this bacterium. And in, in northwest Kansas, um, especially if you're in a drought year, you may have other things that's maintaining this bacteria in your herd uh, because even droughts, can affect uh, uh, fly populations. But uh, as you look through these slides, really what I want you to look at is, you know, there's other things that can cause this. There's certain breeds that are more susceptible to this. I think most of you guys that are uh, involved with beef animals, they'll probably know this. Uh, there's a, actually vaccines out there for pink eye. I do not have any data on efficacious of these vaccines, uh, but there are some. Uh, probably the, the, the more wise thing to do instead of asking a person like me, but is asking a local veterinarian in your area that deals with pink eye on what they recommend. But uh, as you can see, uh, any animal that has uh, light coloration uh, around their eyelids tends to have more problems. Uh, as you look at a herd and if you have a producer, that has pink eye problems. There, there are different stages it can go through. And uh, stage one, um, some people can catch it at this stage. Uh, some people uh, don't catch it at this stage at all. But where you usually see this is the, the cattle, cattle tend, their eyes tend to water more, or they'll tend to seek shade 
uh, and, and, and just to because the the this infection is affecting the eye, so any kind of light is is an irritation to the eye. Uh, this is a picture of a clinical stage one infection, a pink eye. Uh, this is stage two. This is the stage that most people see, especially most producers see. Uh, you'll get that uh, white dot right in the center of the cornea. Uh, and yes, this is how it's really got its name, pink eye. This is where you've got more blood vessels, trying to pump more blood to the area of the infection, and you get the pink appearance out on the edge of the cornea. Um, and, and why this is important to you guys is because of a particular fly. If you get to this stage, I mean, of course, you need to do something, but uh, again, once you get to stage three, uh, that animal it could be a carrier uh, of this. If you have a fly problem, especially face flies, this becomes an exponential problem for a producer because it can spread to a herd uh, at a pretty rapid rate when you have both flies and animals at this stage. And of course, if it's at this pus-like stage, you, you've got to get some kind of treatment on those animals, really to prevent an outbreak within the herd. Uh, is, uh, like I said, if you have any questions, please ask as we go through this. So you, you heard me talk about an economic threshold, and this is one that's kind of been developed, but uh, really related to a, path, a pathogen threshold. Uh, the face fly itself is not taking a blood meal, so it's not really stressing the animal uh, as much as a biting fly would. But what it's doing is it, it's, it's irritating the animal to make that animal's eyes water more. Um, and what our, our recommendation is, if you see 10 to 20 of these flies in and around the eye, uh, then you need to implement some kind of fly treatment. And really one that I, I, I want to advocate for just face flies are uh, pyrethroid insecticide ear tags. Even though it's in the ear, um, you, we get a lot of a good efficacious control and even sometimes repellency with pyrethroid type products uh, for face flies. And these are very similar to house flies. And really, even a, like a person like me that looks at flies on a daily basis, we have to bring them into the lab and look at them under a microscope to see the difference. But I will say uh, for the, from the northeast part, all the way, I'd say from uh, all the way from northeast, all the way to maybe west of Salina, this could be, uh, face flies could be a yearly problem for you guys in Kansas. And uh, really when you look at this, if you have a producer that's having a pink eye problem and having a fly problem, uh, you can go out there and if they have 10 to 20 flies per animal, then they need to implement some kind of fly control. And really what, what, it, what really makes a fly, face fly different than a house fly is uh, they have these, what we call these presetomal teeth on their mouth part that really irritates the, the cattle's eye and it makes it water more, which in turn makes it shed more bacteria for that fly to pick it up and transport it to an uninfected animal. This is what those things look like. So this would be a, a, a kind of a micrograph of, uh, of a face fly mouth part. Uh, so it's got a sponging type mouth part, just like a house fly does, but that area circled in yellow is what we call those presetomal teeth. And that's what's scratching the cattle's eye, and that's what's really causing the irritation of that animal. And really to see this, um, you, so this was a trial done in uh, actually Nebraska in the late 90s. Uh, so this is a Hereford animal. You can see here you have a screen um, uh, all in the background here that's uh, it's, uh, enclosing flies in there. So this is the animal that has no flies exposed to it. And so this is the animal in the pen next to that animal. Uh, so that's how much just face flies make their eyes water. Uh, so this is why they're more of a problem in keeping the pink eye pathogen more prominent in a herd. Um, and when I say a face fly, we call them a mechanical vector, meaning that the, the bacteria is not really multiplying in the fly at all, but uh, the fly is efficient at picking it up and then depositing it on uninfected animals, really because they're uh, they can make the cattle's eyes water like this. 
The, the other thing about this fly that makes it different is that it overwinters as, as an adult. Uh, most of our flies either that affect cow-calf systems or pasture animals overwinter as pupae or sometimes larvae or maggot stage under the manure pads. And this one overwinters as an adult. This is a farmhouse in central Nebraska. And we call these hibernaculums. So if you have a, a house that, that, can, that can retain heat, uh, and sometimes what we've noticed here recently is it doesn't have to be an old house. It can be an, a fairly new construction house. Uh, they can harbor these. Sometimes these are the very first flies that are on the screens of the homeowner's house. Uh, and especially if they're not metallic uh, green or metallic black and they look like a house fly, but they're coming out really early. So some, some parts of that is as early as March 1st, uh, then they may be coming out from these hibernaculums. That's, a, that's an issue because, uh, because a lot of these things, we can control these flies uh, and really knock their populations down, but when they overwinter as adults, uh, they essentially uh, are compounding the problem because can't really find these hot hibernaculums on a regular basis. Uh, Sandy just asked these, the question, are these really big flies? So if you want a comparison, this fly is the exact same uh, size of a house fly. So it's anywhere from a quarter of an inch to half an inch in length, uh, and it looks just like a face fly. So a face, I mean a house fly. And so they, these flies are, if you were to go in, onto a picnic, they look like those flies there. So they're not as big as what we consider our Californids, our uh, our blowflies, uh, but they're in there. So they're what we call medium-sized fly. And so, are there any questions on face flies and, and pink eye at this point? Um, if you're typing some questions, I may go on, and then I can come back to it if I need to. But um, really. The, and, and to kind of really reiterate the point, uh, most control that you can do for a face fly is on the herd level. So you need to put some kind of pyrethroid or ear tag in them and that will keep your face flies. Now the challenge is, is if you have a face fly problem and a horn fly problem, um, you're going to have to rotate those ear tags. And we have some issues with pyrethroid ear, ear tags with uh, horn flies, especially when it comes to resistance. Excuse me. So. The, ne the next uh, fly group I'm going to be talking about are what we consider our blood sucking flies. So uh, if you're looking at this screen, um, you see um, different fly species, and I've already got stable flies and horse, horse and deer flies listed. But uh, horn flies are considered the number one external parasite on beef animals, especially in cow calf systems and in stalker systems. Uh, you know, in a cow-calf system, they, we, we know that these types of flies can reduce weaning weights. Uh, they can just make the animal less efficient uh, and so forth. Um, the reason why these types of flies can talk, cause more problems because these cause direct damage. So this is a blood-feeding parasite that causes stress to the animal. And what I mean, what I mean by stress is that essentially for every time you have one of these types of flies biting that animal, uh, you're, you're going to have either, either a behavioral modification by the animal or you're going to have a physiological uh, modification by the animal. And sometimes that physiological adaptation is they divert resources either from away from producing milk to biting the parasites. And so with that, anytime you have a, a, a large population of these blood feeding uh, flies, it directly affects your animals. So when you look at this, again, I've said some of these points, it's considered the number one external parasite of pastured animals. Uh, our economic threshold can range from 200 to 300. And why we have that range is because if you have body, if you have animals that are in low body condition score, then they're going to be on that lower end of that threshold. And in fact, in most cases, I see cattle that if their body condition uh, score below a five, then uh, if they have 100 flies on them, then those flies are really affecting those animals as well. Um, so 200 to 300 is considered the economic threshold. Uh, there's studies that have done across the nation. We've done some here. 
there's actually done some done in Kansas by um, uh, I think Owenby uh, in the 80s. Uh, they're in Hayes, in fact, that did some of these studies on the effect of corn flies on growing cattle. And when you look at this across the board, whether it's a new study that we did here or one that some done in Nebraska and in, in Kansas, uh, growing cattle, so those either measuring weaning weights or a measured production time for stalkers, get, gain an extra one and a half pounds per week if you keep corn flies under control. And we'll have, what I mean by that is that you're keeping them under uh, 200 uh, to 300 corn flies per animal. Um, so Jenny has a question up there, and, and I'll address that a little bit later, whether you need one or, or two ear tags. But uh, the, the, the thing to consider is uh, ear tags are an important control measure. Um, so when you look at this, and this kind of relates to Jenny's question of why are ear tags effective on horn flies, whereas they're not on some other body fly species, such as like the stable fly. And really the answer to this question is because they spend their entire adult life on the animal. Other flies, as the adults, they just visit that animal as short as 10 minutes a day just to get their blood milk. These things are on that animal all day long, and they're taking anywhere. They're, they're biting that animal. One ind individual fly is biting that animal 20 to 25 times a day. And so that's why these things can really stress an animal and, and really depress the efficiency of that animal as well. Um, and that's why uh, ear tags can be effective at these. They're, they're on the animal, they're distributing product on that animal to uh, get effective control because that, that fly is staying on that animal. But with that, if you use the same type of ear tag over and over, that's where we run into resistance because you've got the product and the fly on the animal at, on long periods of time and which can lead to certain levels of resistance. So when, when you look at this, the, the basic thing that I want to advocate is to really don't use the same chemical class of insecticide for one flight over and over. Uh, so this is the type of question that I get from a producer. How many flies are a problem? We kind of address that 200 to 300 is when we start seeing economic uh, damages to those animals. Uh, when should I use tags? How long do tags last? Do I need to tag all the animals or can I use alternative control tactics such as sprays or forearms or even injectables? And I'm going to address some of this from here on out. And this is where I'm going to get into some specific control tactics, especially a newer a control tactic considered called the vet gun. But if you were to look at this, if you see this animal, uh, that's a lot of horn flies. Uh, this, we took, we had a trial going down in southeast Oklahoma, uh, which is almost like Louisiana for a, a lot of parts of Oklahoma. And we can have horn flies on animals starting in February and go through November. Uh, so it's a high pressure environment for horn flies. And this, this picture was taken around, I think, uh, mid-May. So we're well over, in fact, I had a student count every fly on this animal. And I think she almost pulled her hair out trying to count all the flies on this animal, but she, she counted out to nearly over a thousand flies. So, and we run into that quite a bit here in Oklahoma. And, um, and really how we want to avoid these large populations that can become resistant to the products is that you, you need to kind of advocate a in, corn fly insecticide resistant management. And a lot of you guys have seen this. This was on the previous one, but I really want to reiterate this. I've changed some of the thing, the recommendations up because we've lost the chemical class. But uh, again, try not to treat these animals until they get to that economic threshold, especially with ear tags, because if you put an ear tag in too early, then it's going to lose the, the efficacy of that product and that ear tag is going to wear out before you really have a corn fly problem in July and August. Uh, which is usually the time we start seeing a lot of increased corn fly population. If you look at this, point number two is very important, especially with ear tags. Pyrethroid ear tags are the ones that we have the most problems with in, with insecticide resistance to corn flies. 
And, and the main reason for this is because, you know, resistance is controlled at the genetic level for these flies. And, he, and you may hear about resistance to dewormers as well as external parasites. Everything's controlled at the genetic level, but certain things can either speed the selection of those genes up or slow the selection of those genes down. So you're not selecting for just a resistant population for, uh, within a given period of time. And really what I want to advocate is pyrethroids we have a lot of problems with, but they're still good tools to use if you can use them properly. And why they're a problem is because the resistant gene, it, it can stay, stay at a high level within a population uh, as it overwinters to the next year. Whereas organophosphates, we can have a population of horn flies become resistant to a chemical, a organophosphate, but usually we don't see that resistance carry over in the overwintering population as much as say the pyrethroids. And so there's two, there's two genes that encode for resistance in horn flies for pyrethroid. Uh, and there's really just one main gene uh, that encodes for resistance in horn flies for organophosphates. The other thing, you know, you know, I even have veterinarians that don't do this. So you say, well, I forgot to cut my ear tags out. Really, you need to cut those ear tags out at the end of the season. And what, I mean, the end of the season, uh, in, in the fall, when you're either processing them or, or checking those animals, whether you're in a fall cabin season or, or spring cabin season, in the fall, you need to cut those tags out because there's still a little bit of product that are being exposed to flies out there and it's just not killing them. And so that, again, that can lead to resistance development. So if additional horn fly control is needed and if you've gone in there and tagged an animal and it's just not working, so you have product failure within a three week period, then you need to switch to the type of method you use. I really don't advocate you going back to an ear tag, but maybe going to either a pour-on or a spray. We still use back rubbers here, so and it's still an effective control measure if you use them. And then if pyrethroid ear tags have failed, you need to stay away from any kind of pyrethroid class, which eliminates a lot of products for cow-calf producers, because there's a lot of products that are just pyre pyrethroids. Um, again, these two points down here, especially related to ear tags, no more than once every three years if you're going to use a pyrethroid ear tag. And for organophosphate ear tags, do not use more than two years in a row. So when I say rotate, it's on a yearly basis. So year one, you can start off with a pyrethroid tag and then switch to an organophosphate tag and then go to something else. This is what I advocate when I talk to uh, anybody in the, in the beef industry and concerned about horn fly control and if they're gonna use ear tags. Uh, there's a, a product out there called XP820. It's an avomectin tag, so it's in that macrocyclic lactone class. Uh, and so why I advocate this rotation? So this is a three-year rotation. So year one, you would start off with an XP820 tag. Year two, you'd go to an organophosphate tag. And there's several different ones. Uh, Carathon is the newest. And then you go to a pyrethroid tag. And, and why, and the reason for this, is essentially uh, the, how it kills the insect. So uh, organophosphates here uh, are these, what we call these cholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, so they're a group one resistance category. Uh, when it comes to pyrethroids, they're sodium channel modulators. So the insecticide is attacking the sodium channel within the nervous synaptic channel to kill that insect. And then we have the macrocyclic lactones or abomectin in this case, which is the XP820 ear tag, uh, is a chloride channel modulator. So it, it uh, is attacking chloride, chloride ions instead of sodium ions in the target site. And then organophosphates actually targets a completely different target site. So, that's why we uh, have some uh, issues with um, resistance. Uh, and this is the, the rotation that I advocate. This is different from the previous presentation I gave you guys because we've lost the chemical class. Uh, we used to have a, a organic, organic chlorine, but it's no longer available. 
to the cattle market. Uh, the EPA is taking it off of the shelves at this point in time. This is a list of all of the um, uh, commercially available ear tags. Uh, and I, I checked in, in Kansas for you guys and all these are acceptable for you guys in Kansas as well. They're, they're, they're on your Department of Ag's uh, website as accepted products for your state. Uh, what I like, I put this together because I was have, I got a lot of questions on which applicator gun I need, uh, and this kind of addresses some of that. Um, this double barrel VP, I'm not a really high on a product like this because this has a pyrethroid and an organophosphate in it. Uh, so it goes really against what I just told you on a three-year rotation. Essentially, if you use a product like this and resistance builds up, you essentially could have a, uh, a, a horn fly population that's resistant to both pyrethroids and organophosphates. So I'm not a big advocate of this, but you, you know we still have some producers that get decent control, but they're you know they're not dealing with the high resistant horn flies. Uh, so Corathon is the newest one, uh, and it's uh, you know, again it's an all flex tagger. This is a bear tag. Uh, Warrior, we tested Warrior this past year, and I'll show you some results. Uh, and, it, and it's a pretty good tag, and it's in, uh, and it's one that's been on the market for a while, too. These are your pyrethroid tags. Uh, again, uh, if you were to look at this, anything that's a synergized pyrethroid is better. So synergized means it has this uh, piperonyl butoxide. And then uh, anything with piperonyl butoxide is going to be more efficacious than just permethrin. Um, so really, anything that's a 10% product, if you have any kind of resistance develop, developed in here, uh, that 10, those 10% products aren't going to work very well for you. Uh, Silence Ultra is, uh, uh, is a, the newest pyrethroid ear tag out there. Uh, again, it's made by Bear, and it, and it works pretty, pretty well. The thing about the new bear tags is they have a new technology that kind of has a, a, a delayed release of some of their product. So essentially, you may see that you're the, like the Silence Ultra tag or the Carathon tag uh, may not be working as well as other ear tags early in the season, but then it really starts working for you later in the season when you need that ear tag working for you in July and August. Uh, now going back to, to uh, Jenny's question about two-year tag versus one. And of course, here's the macrocyclic black tone tag, the XPA20. It's a yellow tag. It's made by white tags. Um, and going back to Jenny's question, if you need um, essentially uh, uh, one-year tag or two-year tags, uh, this all depends on the behavior of the animal. And this comes down to which uh, animals I advocate tagging. So this is a cow. We took this picture. Um, uh, uh, this is near Stillwater. Uh, so this is 100 flies. Uh, this is not an economic threshold. But what I want you to notice is uh, what do you see along the back here uh, from a low level uh, horn fly? She's already tossing her head back. You got slobber trails down this animal. So this is even not at the economic threshold. And she's already reacting to these flies. So um, the, um, so going back to Jenny's question, I always advocate two tags per cow. Uh, but if a, and if a calf is on, still on that cow, cow, that calf doesn't need to be tagged uh, because that calf is getting product from the cow. Uh, now there is one tag that is marketed as a one tag per animal and it's called a Python Magnum tag and it's a pyrethroid tag. And it's a larger tag, so uh, they can. That's that's how they're trying to get away from just two tags versus one tag. And it still works pretty well, but anytime I see a ear tag use, I always go for two tags because it's all about how that animal moves uh, its head. And uh, so going back to this, essentially, every time this cow tosses its head back, uh, it's distributing product on its back and its side. And, back, and so it'll toss its head back. And so um, I'm, I'm gonna try to address some of these questions. So a lot of these questions are coming in now. Um, 
what are what was the brand name of the chemical class that is no longer available? The brand name was called um, um, Avenger ear, ear tag. It's uh, called Avenger. I think that was from Jared. Uh, you may still be able to find this on the shelves because essentially they're the company is allowed to sell out of their stock. But uh, we checked around several stores here in Oklahoma and nobody had these available last year. And they started pulling this off, I think, in 2000, uh, in the 2012, going into 2013. Uh, Austin asked a question on thoughts on the Python insecticide cattle strips. Um, so the data I've seen, uh, both from the company and from a study done in Nebraska, the strips stay on pretty well. Uh, and, uh, and, that's a, and that's a good alternative because you're not having to put another hole in that cow's ear, that heifer's ear. And the other thing you have to consider, these just slip on to an existing ear tag that's already in there. And with all the new ident identification going into place with traceability, you know, you, you know, if you have something that just slip, slips on an ID tag, then you know, that's a good viable option. option. And it's pretty, uh, the, the data I've seen, it's just as efficacious, efficacious as a normal ear tag. Um, the, the only issues I've seen with the strips is, uh, that if you, um, if you don't get them in, put in properly, like if you don't slide that strip all the way down onto that tag, some of them will fall out. And that's what I've, I've talked to the company reps at YTEX and, uh, that's what they said. If you don't get them slipped down all the way, then you could have some problems with losing them. So if you, if you. The, so these are just as good as the ear tags are, uh, as far as, <laughs> excuse me, controlling horn fly. Uh, and if you want to just get one, I think the, the, my, my general rule of thought is if you're in an area that has a significant fly problem year to year, then you need to go with two, two tags. If you're in an area that you just have occasional fly problems or it's very seasonal depending on the weather, you probably could get away with one, but you've got to read the, the, the product label. And if the product label says use two tags per animal, that's really what I try to advocate too because at least they're going on that, the label, uh, going with the label. So um, the strips are a good, a good alternative and they work just as well as an ear tag. Um, this is what uh, 500 horn flies looks like. Uh, it goes all the way down from the, the, the back of that animal down to the side, down to the belly of the animal. Uh, and so uh, essentially, uh, again, I, I've got a colleague up in central Nebraska at North Platte. Uh, he has animals looking like this uh, starting in mid-June. Uh, we have animals looking like this uh, as early as uh, May, in certain, first of May to mid-May in certain parts. So you guys would probably be somewhere in between. So I'd say if you've got some kind of product in those animals around late May to early June, then you're doing good because the ear tag should work for you for at least three months. Uh, and that gets you, gets you through that critical months of July and August because that's when we see the highest levels of horn fly population on animals. So uh, the next slides, I'm gonna show you some data from 2013 uh, in our ear tag uh, trial. And what you see here, and so uh, when I say control, so this is uh, the 2013 insecticide ear tag trial that we put out in Valiant, Oklahoma, is that down in Southeast Oklahoma. So it's almost like, uh, um, essentially Louisiana and I've just kind of grabbed different weeks so you can see two weeks after putting an ear tag in you want to see control eight weeks after putting an ear tag in sometimes we'll see where a product can be performing uh, by 13 weeks after uh, ear tag is put in is when you are in the brunt of the horn fly season so you so essentially by week 13 you're in the brunt of horn fly season and you can see from our control so these are the number of horn flies per side of animal so these blue bars here the control here uh we're you know well above 
Uh, so we're at that 200 threshold week, eight weeks after control, uh, putting that ear tag in. And we put these ear tags pretty early because we weren't quite sure when the horn fly population would come in on those animals. So I think we put these ear tags in uh, in April. Uh, and so eight weeks, uh, you know, we're getting into June there. Um, and then you can see by week 10, just two weeks later, um, we see uh, we're well above uh, our economic threshold. So you're, almost, you're nearly at 600 horn flies per animal. Um, and what I really want to show you is that uh, we, I like to advocate a two threshold level. And uh, when you have a two threshold level, essentially uh, those animals that are in a good body condition score are at that 200 horn fly uh, per, per animal. But when you have an animal in a low body condition score, uh, you're going to have to lower that threshold to probably 100 horn flies per animal. So given on this scale, that's when they reach 50 here. And what I want to advocate is we uh, only had one ear tag that stayed below that lower threshold. And that's the XPA 20 ear tag. Uh, we tested the new bear tag, the silent ultra. This is a pyrethroid tag. And the corathon is the organophosphate uh, type tag. So this is the upper threshold. So this is the standard threshold that most animals can see uh, that you want to base your uh, control measures on. And that's the 200 horn flies per animal. So essentially our XP820 worked really well. Our Carathion and Silence Ultra didn't keep it below the economic threshold that we'd like to see. And of course by week 13 in this area, we have significant fly pop populations on all these animals. But uh, XP820 is work, working well for us in a high po uh, horn fly population area. Um, the other thing I want to uh, show you is our uh, Stillwater trial. We have more products that we put out. In fact, uh, we put out um, uh, several different types of organophosphates and different uh, uh, types of pyrethroids. So again, if you want to look at this, Python is a pyrethroid, Silent Ultra is a pyrethroid, Warrior is an organophosphate, Parathion is an organophosphate. So we didn't, we only, not only did we want to compare within chemical, uh, from different chemical class, but also within chemical class to see how the product was testing. And again, so we tagged these animals essentially in the end of May. So two weeks after control, again, you can see, um, I'm trying to find my cursor, sorry. Um, it, this, uh, we're well above the threshold here. At, so this would be nearly oh, reaching 300 flies per animal right here. So all of our air tags are working pretty well. Anytime you have a tag that goes above your control, that's really not good. Uh, but in uh, these animals are all fairly close to each other. Yeah, but uh, sometimes this can be a product of where your, where your trial is as well. But uh, what I want to advocate, look at your XP820. It's keeping the horn fly population well below both the, the upper and lower threshold. So this this prop this XP820 this abamectin tag is really working well for us and and this is in an area that we've had some pyrethro resistant horn fly populations develop so that's really what I suspect here is we've got some resistance developing here uh, going through this population but as you can also see their plastic matrix so this population went up but it kept the population going down. And then our warrior tag, we had a lot of horn flies come in on these uh, animals that were tagged with the warrior tag. Um, so if you want to look at this on a per cost basis, uh, this is what it's going to cost. So the XP820 tag, uh, we, this, is a, this is an average cost, and this is a retail cost. So again, this is basing this on two tags per animal. And essentially, you're looking at this. So you're, you're at, you know... Um, Four dollars and thirty cents per head, uh, but the the thing to consider is that um, it's pretty comparable to these bear bear tags that just came out, the silent ultra and carathon tag. If you want to compare this to some older technologies like the dust bag, uh, I mean it, it's 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 more, 
but in a dust bag application, you got to make sure every animal is getting treated. So you're going to put this in a pen that's going up to a water trough that they have to go to on a daily basis. The other thing about a uh, dust bag, or and even a cattle grub, it, it, you've got to keep these things clean to keep them working. Uh, sometimes we have more issues with the cattle rubs than the dust bag, but uh, that's something to consider. But I will say it's still a viable option for, for people. And then if you were to look at this, and I don't have it up here, if you were to look at this on a, uh, if you were to spray these animals, uh, you would essentially have to spray these animals once a month to attain the same level of control those ear tags uh, uh, achieve throughout this trial. And so essentially, you're, it may be cheaper initially to spray, but as you go through the season and you keep spraying those animals to keep the horn fly populations down, then you, you, you pretty much come out to the same level of control, unless you're using a really cheap product. And usually what I advocate, if it's cheap, you're usually getting what you pay for. So, and, it, and that goes back to an ear tag as well. You buy a cheap ear tag, it's going to perform at, a, at probably a cheap level. We've seen this throughout our one flight trials throughout the various years. Okay, any questions on ear tags? Um, and they're still a good tool. And the strips essentially work exactly like the ear tags do, but they're just making it more easy for a producer to, to put them in uh, if they've already got tags in those ears. So, but if you're, if you go to the strips and they only have one tag per animal, you may not get as good as coverage as um, your uh, ear tags would that you're putting in both, end, both ears. So these are what we consider, what I consider the best management practices, the two R's. Rotate the chemical classes and remove the tags at the end of the year. And when you have an operator that has multiple herds, do not use more than one product per herd that's in a pasture. Now, if, you ha if he has um, uh, multiple herds that are in different pastures, he can use different products, <coughs> excuse me, just as long as he's not mixing those animals in and have different products. Again, the reason behind this is that you could be selecting for horn flies that become resistant to two different chemical classes. And that can become a problem because essentially you've taken two years out of your rotation uh, and boiled it down to one product and hopefully you don't develop resistance to these macrocyclic lactones that, that, that is working. Any questions on ear tags at this point? Okay. Um, we have a lot of producers that use uh, IGRs. IGR stands for insect growth regulators. Uh, this is a national map of when you should start applying those IGRs. IGR is, a, is more of a preventative measure. And what I mean by that is controlling, controlling the, the maggots within the manure pack. So the, the cattle, uh, the cow or heifer, uh, takes in the product from licking a mineral tub or any general area, uh, anywhere they put mineral out with IGR, that's how they uptake it, and then it's secreted through the manure. And it's preventing the, essentially the, the maggots from becoming an adult fly. And usually for your area, April 1st is when you should start applying this, you know, but today here in Oklahoma, we're going to have, it's going to be 85 degrees today. So uh, if it stays like this, uh, then we need to be pretty proactive on our fly control and getting our IGR out. Uh, usually for Oklahoma, I advocate that March 15th day is better for everyone in Oklahoma. But for you guys in Kansas, if you stick to the April 1st, you, you're probably going to be pretty good. A general rule of thumb I use is try to put out uh, IGRs 15 days after you have your last hard free. And that's, uh, if, if you're, if you're going to put out an IGR, make sure it's out when you have that average last uh, hard freeze day. Uh, and sometimes if you were to look at this uh, uh, for Oklahoma, then, you know, in the panhandle, that could be all the way in the mid-April, late April. Uh, but if you look in the southeast Oklahoma, it could be anything as, as, as early as March, March 1st. So it can vary across the state, and it's pretty similar to you guys. So um, just make sure you get it out. It's more of a preventative. 
and it's in the mineral. Uh, it does nothing to kill adult hornflies. So if you have uh, adult hornflies on your on an operation at a high level, you've got to get some kind of uh, control tactic that's going to get them down immediately. That it, that uh, kills the adult population, not just uh, the maggot population. Really, where we see an IGR uh, do well is in a combination program. So you got your IG out out early, and then maybe you've got to implement some kind of chemical control later in the season to keep the whole adult fly populations down. That's where we really see an IGR uh, work for producers because um, in a combination effect. But if you just use an IGR alone, just realize that it does nothing for your adults. And so you may be doing great and then your neighbors uh, are doing nothing for a period of time and then realize they have a, a fly problem and then spray their animals and so those corn flies essentially could move on to those animals that are being treated with IGR only. So again, this is a more of a preventative technique, but it's a good one. Okay, uh, from the next few slides, I'm going to go through this video. Um, hopefully this video comes out good on your end. I, uh, I, I meant to test this with Sandy, but uh, if it doesn't work, just uh, chime in. But this is going to introduce you guys to the vet gun if you have... Some of you may already be familiar with this, so I'm going to play this video, kind of get, they go through. This is a company video that's a pr promotional video, and then I'll kind of go through the aspects of what we think about it and how it performs. Nope, oh, it's not even working on my end. So essentially, uh, sorry about that. I tested this earlier and it did work, but um, so I apologize for that. If you want to look at uh, a video uh, of this and how it works. You can get type in vet gun application on online and there's all kinds of uh, uh, videos that the company, the company that makes this is called Agri Labs. So they have various other veterinary products that they distribute and market towards the beef uh, industry. So uh, this, is, this is a new product. Essentially it's a paintball gun that's shooting insecticides onto the animal. And this is the company's data that they put out with their literature. Uh, this vet gun, so in fact, they did this trial, uh, I think near Kansas City somewhere, uh, when I talked to the company rep. And so they actually mark when they get rain events because a rain event will affect uh, application, this type of application, it's pretty similar to a poron. They compare it to Sabre Extra Tags. The only thing I want to say about Sabre Extra Tags is this is your, one of your low concentration pyrethroid tags. So again, I'm not real high on this tag anyway. So this is their data. This is our data uh, compared to what I would consider uh, better ear tags. So what I really want to advocate to is the vet gun is this blue bar blue bar here and essentially it's going above our untreated animal. This is our untreated animal group and we went out longer than this but I just went out eight weeks because basically what we had to do start doing is we had to retreat these animals with the vet gun application uh, essentially three times throughout the season and that, that's going to come into a cost. Uh, so again, that's comparing to putting in one ear tag at the first of the season. And this is how, the low level that the horn fly populations are with various ear tags. Again, this is your XP820 down here. Uh, this one here is your Silence Ultra. Again, I think we're dealing with some resistance issue with pyrethroid. Uh, and then our Python Magnum, this one down here. Uh, this, is, um, this is a pyrethroid as well, but it's that larger tag that the company markets is just putting in one ear tag per, per, per animal. And it's still working pretty well. And it worked significantly better, better than a Silence Ultra. But if you were to look at this later in the season, uh, our Silence Ultra is really comparable to the Python Magnum. And really why I'm showing you this is showing you how this vet gun application works. So you've got a paintball application, you've got a gun that you're shooting these animals. And when we shot the animals, uh, you're always going to have your high-headed animals that react more to this than the others. Uh, some general rules 
that I, I try to follow is you're always going to have to bring these animals up and, uh, with feed, whether it's with cubes or hay, to get them close enough to get the product on them. And these, they use orange balls, but essentially you're shooting the animals, and it marks the animal as, as they're being shot. And, uh, and the thing I advocate to you is remember which side of the animal you're shooting because we had students that shot animals twice because they didn't, they thought the animal was untreated. Uh, so, and the other thing that you have to consider is you're gonna get into a dose issue. Uh, the label recommends one vet cap, uh, one little paintball per 600 pounds. And so you're gonna have some, quite a bit of cows that you're gonna have to put two of those per cow just because of weight. Uh, this is the, the retail cost comparison if you want to compare the vet gun to an ear tag. Essentially, the, to buy the vet gun at the retail level, it's going to cost you about $250. Uh, if you get the different capsules, uh, this is a retail price, about $80 for a 30 count capsule. Uh, comes out to $2.62 per dose. Uh, and sometimes I think the company tries to lean on saying, hey, this is only going to cost you uh, two dollars an animal versus four dollars an animal, but really, if you look at this on a on a correct dosage rate and to get a proper coverage uh, of those animals, I think it's really going to be pretty comparable to an ear tag. And based on our trial alone, where we had to retreat at least three times with just going on their recommendation of one capsule per animal. Uh, it came out to four dollars, anywhere from four fifty per animal to four seventy five per per head. Really, where we had to retreat some of these herds on a multiple level, it's getting close to five dollars per head. And if you look at the good ear tags that are out there, they're performing really well for uh, horn fly populations, and they're costing four thirty four dollars and thirty cents to four dollars and eighty cents. And again, this is putting two two ear tags per animal not the one ear tag per animal. So I, I think in the long run, really your ear tags are performing better than the spec gun. But where I see the advantage of this is if you compare this to if you have operators that do not have good working facilities, this is a good viable option for them. If they just, if they're, sometimes we have a lot of weekend ranchers here in Oklahoma and what, and what I mean by that is that uh, they check their animals on the weekends because they have another job. It's their, their main source of income. And so they're checking their animals on Saturday and Sunday and sometimes Friday. And that's when they're going to check them. They're not going to process them through any kind of working facility. And I mean, this is a viable option for them. This is a study that was done in Texas that compared the vet gun system to a poron system. And really what this line is, is your untreated animals the black bar is your poron, and your gray bar is your uh, is your your vet gun. And basically, uh, the vet gun performed better than the untreated animals up to 18 days after treatment, uh, but did not perform as well as the poron did. And it didn't keep them below that uh, uh, 200 horn fly level. But then also our control within this study, this was done in Texas, the controls also went below, uh, below 200. Uh, so this is another way to look at this. Uh, this top graph is to look at this, uh, comparing percent control based on those untreated animals throughout the year. And so I, I like, when I look at something that, and companies that put out data like this, I like to look at this top graph more than this, this bottom graph, because this bottom graph is only comparing our, the pre-treatment counts. And our four or five populations can go up and down to see that the pre-treatment count could have been low at the, at the time when they took this. But if you want to look at this, so essentially by 25 days after treatment, your poron is still getting around 80% control, but the vet gun system is, on, is going all the way down to 60% control. If you want to use a product like this I, for within a month's time, so 30 days, I'd want to see this around 80%. And really to get this labeled uh, for uh, a new market, 
it has to be above 90% for EPA to even accept it as, a, as an efficacious product. Okay, discussion on the vet, yeah, I'm sorry the video didn't work. Um, uh, basically, if you want to look it up, just type in vet gun on the web and you'll, you'll get it automatically. It's produced by um, AgriLabs. I think the biggest issue is the chemistry within the malt. And it's a pyrethroid. It's lambicyhalothrin. It's That's a type of pyrethroid. And basically where you can maybe get some uh, uh, better control with this is just treating those animals with high numbers. So this may be a good option for treating bulls. So, um, you, I mean, uh, you're definitely going to have to put one more than one capsule per bull, a mature bull that's in a breeding program. But, uh, and then also you may have your high fly carrier. We know that your certain animals, even within black animals, like your, your purebred Angus animals, there's certain animals that are always going to have higher levels of parasite, higher levels of horn fly. Maybe only try to treat those animals, and that would delay resistance. Uh, but the company, I've talked to the company, they're trying to get more uh, chemistries labeled for their vet, vet cap, their vet balls, uh, and hopefully, and they're, they're working towards a macrocyclic lactone application. Um, again, the thing, you have, the thing you have to think about are dose, dose issues. So if you have a, um, it's just like your forearms. If you're not weighing your animals, you're not quite sure if uh, your animals are getting the correct, correct dose. Really, I'm open to your ideas. Maybe some other challenges that are associated with this. Please go online, look at this. This is one of the newest things that's come out on the market uh, or the hornfly gun. Again, this is a cost comparison for that. Um, any questions on the vet gun? at this point, is as you're typing, I can re-address them as we go through them. Um, hopefully I haven't put you to sleep. I know I've gone through a lot of information. So uh, we're getting a lot of questions. Sandy brought this point up right before I got on with you guys on uh, injectable type products. Um, uh, Sandy put on a, in the chat one vet gun video, um, but uh, any questions on the vet gun? Oh, okay. She's trying to copy a link to the, the vet gun. And sorry that didn't show up. That showed up earlier. Uh, but um, so we've got this uh, new product that's come out. It's called Avomec Long Range. Um, and for an injectable product, uh, it's, it's, it's a good product. Uh, it's a microcyclic lactone. It's an ivermectin. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if it has Epronix in it, but I know it's an ivermectin type product. Uh, in general, injectable products are not very good at controlling external parasites. Even blood feeding external parasites like a, uh, like a horn fly. Uh, usually porons are better at giving, more, uh, at getting, giving adequate fly control for two weeks. Uh, that's usually the, the research that I've looked at Essentially, you're, you're going to get two weeks of control with a foron type product. And really what really affects that is environmental conditions. If you get rain events, if you put that foron, it could de dilute, dilute that product. Um, Ivermec long range does not control horn flies as, as well as insecticidal ear tag. Uh, and, and you may have company reps out there that uh, are advocating Ivermec long range for horn flies. I, I wouldn't do that. Um, any kind of injectable product is not going to be as good at controlling any body fly as your your products that you're applying externally to that animal. Uh, there's a colleague that has done a trial up in Nebraska. Uh, he's going to be sending those slides down to me, and I'll, I'll share those with Sandy, and she can share those with you you guys as well. Uh, but essentially. Uh, um, the injectable products are just not a good type of technique if you're worried about flies. So it, for Aquamec long range, I wouldn't advocate it for horn fly control. Um, I also do internal parasites uh, across Oklahoma and where we see more issues with is with cuperia. 
uh, and that's my, and then and we have some issues with the microcyclic black cones, which are very, and I can uh, address that at a at a different time. But uh, uh, our make long range is not a good way to control them. Any questions on Ivermectin long range? Any questions on um, farm flies? Okay, uh, Sandy's got a video, a YouTube video of the vet gun application. Please go on, find, look at that. Uh, it's it's the it kind of at least shows you how they how this product works. It's been marketed pretty heavily here in Oklahoma, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be marketed up in Kansas as well. Uh, so. At this point in time, I'm going to go into stable flies. Um, again, stable flies used to be considered only a problem for uh, confined feeding operations, whether it's a feedlot or dairy. But with the, the, the these technologies such as uh, winter hay feeding, um, that's what's really brought on the stable flies. And really, uh, grazing steers exposed to stable flies for an extended period of time weighed an average of essentially 37 pounds less than steers that were treated repeatedly with insecticides to protect them from stable flies. And this study was done in central Nebraska in the North Platte. So this is a study that I actually did uh, for my PhD at Kansas State. I was trying to determine um, how many stable flies come out of a hay feeding site. And essentially, if you were to look at this, um, uh, look at this bottom line here, potentially in the springtime, uh, starting now and going through uh, June, and this study was done in Manhattan, Kansas, uh, a hay feeding site, so a winter hay feeding site, a site where you're putting hay out during the winter, but then uh, you just, and then it stays out in the pasture, can provide up to 58 stable, 58,000 stable flies per week. Uh, this picture here uh, is, is a picture of uh, stable fly pupae in a round bell feeding site. So uh, please, if you advocate anything for a pasture system, uh, producers need to clean up their winter hay feeding sites to prevent stable fly development. And really, insecticides don't work very well, but if you clean up that area, that's what works. This, this graph here is a graph from when I did my PhD in Manhattan. And it shows that if you unroll that hay bale while you're feeding it, it essentially provides no habitat for stable flies in the spring. But if you uh, concentrate those animals, even if you have uh, hay feeders that you move periodically, it can still provide uh, stable fly habitat. So, and most people have a hay feeding site, usually in a pen or uh, in a gathering area. But the thing you need to consider is, is if you do something to allow that substrate to dry out, that's what's going to prevent stable fly development. Okay, uh, on to horse flies. And this is, uh, if you were to look at Kansas, maybe uh, probably the eastern half, southeast, and maybe up into the northeast. Uh, again, this is a proven mechanical vector of anaplasmosis. Uh, here in Oklahoma, we have a lot of horse flies and a lot of ticks. And those two are the main, uh, uh, what we consider vectors of anaplas from herd to herd and even within herd. The thing about horse flies is they're the hardest thing to control because only the females feed on the, on the animal and uh, they're only on that animal for a short period of time. Really, the most successful control technique is to locate them away from uh, pastures that have historical horse fly or deer fly problems. And in that area, that means locating them away from air pastures that, have, or that are near lakes or creeks, active creeks. Uh, and that's what kind of really uh, advocating for uh, horse fly control. If you put products on it, it may can reduce the population down for a little bit, but by, I mean, you have overlapping species that can go, to go throughout the summer and by the end of the summer you can you don't have to reapply some kind of control some kind of spray if you have an outbreak of these later in the season uh hopefully it doesn't get to this level uh when you have uh animals if you have animals that look like that uh that may be a management issue but those are all horse uh, horse fly that was taken just south of Stillwater. we can uh here and and this is a picture of their mouth part. 
they have a very painful bite. Uh, and essentially, if you were to look at this mouth part, essentially, the, the, that's, this is looking at the mouth part on, on the side view. And so, those, essentially, when this, and when that mouth part enters the animal, it's cutting the skin sideways. And it's very painful to the animal, and, and again, it can cause a lot of uh, irritation to the animal. This is what the larvae look like. And they're usually found near what we call semi-aquatic area, any area that's going to retain water. Okay, any questions on uh, fly control and bee systems? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to transition into some, some slides on uh, equine. Uh, I didn't cover this last time, but uh, I realize some of you guys may have uh, fly control issues in horse operation. Uh, so, really, the, these are the types of flies that can affect a horse uh, uh, operation on a continual basis. And again, what you see there uh, on the top left is a horse spot fly. Uh, this is an intestinal internal parasite more, but it's the uh, external parasite site uh, stage that's actually laying the eggs. Uh, you can get stable flies, you can get horse flies on them as well, but we also get a biting midge uh, that can affect uh, horses quite a bit. So um, the, uh, if you were to look at these uh, and, and kind of prioritize these, the horse spot is a major issue for equine operations. The body midge is another one. Stable flies are another one. And sometimes if you have horses in, in uh, stalled environments, uh, then house flies can be a major issue. Uh, and then uh, horse flies as well. So uh, these are the main fly species. Body midge, most, more commonly known as noceum. It's a blood sucking fly, very small, very, very small. Uh, 1 16th to 1 8th of an inch. Uh, these are only active uh, during dusk and dawn. Uh, and they prefer to feed on calm, windless nights. So late uh, dusk periods going into nighttime periods is when this fly is feeding on horses. And usually sometimes if I have a horse owner that's having a lot of body midge problems, I ask them to stable their horses at uh, night and put fans on their horses. This is a summertime pest. You shouldn't have a problem with putting a fan on a horse during the summertime. Uh, but stabling horses is uh, a good way. It, sometimes, some people have used insecticide treated screens. So they actually put screens in their barn and just spray the screen and it keeps the biting midge from getting to the horses as well. The other thing uh, uh, body midges cause is cause sweet itch. Uh, a lot of veterinarians will call this summer eczema. Some veterinarians will call this uh, fly allergy dermatitis. And essentially, uh, this, is, this occurs along the mane of the horse, and it, it looks like a real rough area. Sometimes it's a, it's a, it's, they have whelps around this, but there's a specific allergen within the, the body midges saliva that they've isolated that causes uh, this reaction. And so really what you need to do is, uh, is sometimes if you have a, a producer, equine operator, or horse owner that has a body midge, or they say they have fly allergy, dermatitis problems, or summer eczema, uh, then it's, it's caused by this one. It's caused by this uh, very small body fly that you, you don't hardly even see uh, uh, during the daytime. Stable flies can be a major issue with uh, horse operations, uh, and sometimes more to, so of an issue than maybe cow-calf systems. But uh, again, where you're going to find these is in hay feeding areas. But where we really find these is uh, in, in, in where we, uh, if you have stalled animals and any kind of feed being made, uh, being mixed with manure, that's where you're going to find these. And, Really what you need to do is kind of clean those areas up and just haul it off or, or put it into some kind of composting situation. But if you haul it off and just put it in a pile, that pile could, be, could breed these stable flies as well. Um, again, vertical resting sites, so barn walls, you spray those within an equine operation, you're going to get good control of stable flies. 
Uh, residual insecticides uh, should be always put on the legs. Uh, the thing to consider with these, if you have horses in pasture and they have stable fly problems, if you have any kind of uh, forage that gets a lot of dew on it in the mornings, that, uh, that dew is going to dilute that spray out throughout the week. So just be cognizant of that. Both males and females will feed. So you have both, both sexes feeding on, on the horse. This is the comparison of a house fly versus stable fly. Stable flies are pretty much uh, almost uh, identical in size to house fly, but really where you see the difference is this rigid proboscis that sticks out right here. And uh, that's what, that's what uh, they're piercing the skin of that horse's leg to get a blood meal. Okay, um, really the number one fly species that we really need to address in any kind of horse operation or the horse spots. We can have horse spots developing on in a equine population right now. In fact, some parts of Oklahoma, uh, if they don't have any kind of indecticide or any kind of deworming program uh, and, uh, going for those animals, I advocate to put it in them now. Essentially, you have this bee uh, like fly. It's a fly actually, but it looks like a bee. And uh, their life cycle is, is, is pretty long compared to some of these other flies. Uh, their, their larvae, known as bots, uh, burrow into the lips and tongue. Basically, the uh, fly lays its eggs, and then when the horse licks itself, it activates those eggs in the larvae to hatch out of the, the, the eggs and burrow into the lips and tongue. Usually, the larvae migrate throughout the animal to different sites in the stomach and the intestinal tract. And it can, takes up to 10 months. So uh, really any kind of current indecticide, any kind of current dewormer is going to kill bots within that horse. Uh, if, uh, you know, sometimes you may have horse owners now that want to go to a more natural system and don't want to use uh, chemicals in their animals, uh, then what I advocate to those types of producers is to use warm soapy water and go up and down the legs and muzzle of that horse. Uh, starting uh, for sure in April and going through mid-May. Uh, and what that does is the warm water activates the eggs and the soap su suffocates the larvae before they can burrow into, inside that animal. There's three different uh, species that can develop in horses on a common basis, and they, can get, they usually target the intestinal tract, either the stomach or just the intestines of the horse. Uh, larvae pupate in the ground for one to two months, but uh, really it's this time of year when you need to be worried about horse spots. This is what a horse spot looks like flying around a horse, and it looks like they have this characteristic C pattern when they're flying around this image number two, and uh, really they'll always try to lay their e eggs on the inside legs of a horse, and sometimes on the, the posterior side or the back side of the leg of the horse. Uh, and, and what they're doing, uh, again, remember this, this, this fly is not stinging the animal at all, but it's really just flying up to the animal to lay its eggs. That's, that's all it's doing. Um, this is what horse spots look like inside of the stomach of a horse. Uh, again, if it gets to this level, uh, this may be a management issue more so than a common occurrence, but uh, they can really affect that horse. Sometimes it can cause that horse to, to call it and founder and, uh, and cause more problems. So with that, uh, there's a survey done last year from I think the horse, horse.com and this is what most horse owners are using. Horse, most horse owners are still using traps. Uh, the fly predators are what we call the parasitic wasps and where it's targeting just house flies and stable flies. Those are the only two fly species the fly predators kill. So essentially the fly predators are tiny wasps that are laying their eggs in the fly pupae that are killing them. And then uh, some people are still relying on traps. Most people are still relying on sprays. Uh, if you have horses, pest different pest management strategies for different types of flies. Black flies are common uh, in and around uh, clear, uh, uh, clean running water. 
is when you would have this. Again, stable flies. Uh, I, I put something up there for mosquitoes. Uh, you can get occasional horn fly problems, especially if the horses are in the same pasture as the bee pen. So this is a table just for you guys to use uh, to take back to your operations or to take back to your, your equine operators if you want to. With that, um, that's the end of it. I'd like to say thank you guys for your time. Hopefully I didn't bore you too much, give you some information you can use. There's two websites. Uh, livestockbugs.okstate.edu. We put our horn fly trial up there every year. Uh, we don't have two th 2014s up there yet. It's going to be up soon, though. Okay, you guys. Uh, I'll take any questions, and I'll also thank you for your time. <laughs> yeah. I'm a WT graduate, yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Alan Baker, wow. Yeah, Jared, I'll see you in about a week. Any other questions?